Fermenting beer in kegs has a lot of advantages. But the humble corny keg wasn't designed for any of this. It's a serving vessel and you run the risk of blocked dip tubes and questionable spunding practices. So I'm attempting to assemble the ultimate fermentation keg. I'm using the prototype claw hammer keg and customizing it using a pretty cool temperature control addition. Then I'm going to add some wort and see how it does. Will my Franken keg live up to expectations? I'm Martin Keane and this is The Brewlosophy Show. So before I attempt to build the ultimate keg for fermentation, let's take a look at how fermentation in regular kegs work because really all you need is a corny keg like this with very minimal adjustments. This is a ball lock keg. We've got a gas post, a liquid post, a pressure relief valve, and then the lid. And to use this guy, simply sanitize it, fill it with wort, and then you seal it up. And it's, it's a pressurized, sealed, closed vessel. Kind of perfect for fermentation, except for the minor issue of the fact that when you are fermenting, you're generating CO2 and you need to vent it. But there's a pretty easy way to do that. You just need to hook something up to the gas post. The easiest thing to do is take a bit of tubing, connect that to the gas post, and then put this end in some water and you have yourself an airlock. It'll just bubble away. Or if you want to pressure ferment, you can do that in a keg as well. Now this keg can hold a lot of pressure, typically something like 130 psi, which would be ridiculous. Wouldn't recommend that. But if you do want to regulate the pressure, you don't want to use this. You want to use something like this. This is a spunding valve and this can be set to whatever temperature you want the pressure to be at. The way that works is you connect the spunding valve, you use the dial here to set what the pressure should be and once the pressure is beyond that then it will start venting the keg. So if I want to pressure ferment at 30 psi I would just crank this until I have 30 psi in the keg and anything over that it would then be discharged through here. Then when the beer is done, you just disconnect all that stuff. You can pressurize it and force carbonate directly in the keg here. And then you could just hook up a picnic tap or connect this to your regular kegging system, whatever you like, and uh, then serve directly from the keg. If you don't want your finished beer sitting on top of all the trube that will have accumulated at the bottom of the fermenter, and I pretty much never want to do that. So you can just get a second keg, sanitize that, hook up a little jumper cable between this keg and the other one, and then through pressure, you can do a completely closed transfer to that other keg. And this in fact is my fermentation keg. I've fermented in this thing quite a few times and it's pretty good, but there are a few downsides and those are the things that I'm looking to address today. I think the most obvious downside is capacity. If I'm trying to brew a five gallon batch of beer, my five gallon keg is actually too small to get five gallons of finished beer because you have to allow a little bit of space in this keg here for all of the krausen that's going to generate and so forth, the true that's going to be on the bottom. You're not going to end up with five gallons of liquid at the end of this. You do have to brew slightly smaller batches. But honestly, that is the least of the concerns. If you have a keg like this, well, it has a dip tube in it that will probably run all the way to the bottom of the keg. And at the end of fermentation, all of that tube is going to be down there and it might well block the dip tube. Now what you can do is just hope that it isn't blocked and then the first few pints that you pull off that should be all of that gunk from the bottom. But it definitely is a, a, a worry that the dip tube is going to get clogged. Now the way I've been addressing that is to shorten the dip tube. So let me show you. This is a regular dip tube that sits in my keg and then this is a dip tube that I have shortened. And I just took a Dremel to this, cut off from about an inch or so, a few centimeters off the bottom. And now this doesn't quite reach the bottom of the keg. So when I'm pulling beer up, typically the tube is gonna stay untouched and I'm just pulling from the beer that is above that. And I don't have to worry about this thing getting blocked. The other thing you can do is use a floating dip tube assembly. Floating dip tubes float on the surface of the liquid in the keg and they pull from the top rather than the bottom. So that way we can avoid all of that nasty gunk that's in there. But the fact that there is Krausen in there still does mean that we have to worry about what's on the top as well as what's on the bottom. So you might want to use a filter screen 
when you are using a floating dip tube in that case. The other problem that concerns me much, much more is the fact that you can make this thing a pressurized bomb with fermentation. If you think about when the beer is fermenting, there's going to be krausen. And then the krausen is going to get higher and higher up the keg and it could potentially block stuff up. For example, it could block these gas outposts here, which is dangling in the keg. That could get clogged and then we can't vent that way. Now there's another way, of course, to vent a keg, which is the PRV, the pressure relief valve, but potentially that could get clogged as well. And then you've got a problem. When I ferment under pressure in my conical fermenters, I use a spunding valve like this. And the difference with using this spunding valve is look at the size of this hole here. Just compare the size of the holes between those two things there. So there's much more potential for this guy to get blocked than this one. And I'm hoping that my keg solution that I'm gonna to build today will address that. So designed to solve all of these issues of fermenting in the keg, but still keeping the many benefits, I introduce to you the claw hammer keg. Now this is a prototype, but claw hammer have kindly let me show it off. It's not for sale yet. And it's gonna be a little bit different when it comes out. I'll get to that in a bit, but it does differ quite a bit from a regular keg. So for comparison, here's my fermentation keg. This is a bit taller for a start, but really the main difference is on top. So we've got this pretty big opening on the top here and it is secured together the clamp. Putting that aside for a second, if we take a look at what is on this lid, we've got a number of different components. We've got a gas post here and a pressure relief valve. Then we have a 1.5 inch TC spot here and we've got the thermowell as well. This is rated as holding 60 PSI of pressure, although Clawhammer did ask me to point out that the final version may be rated for a little bit less than that for safety. And they're also looking at different ways to really protect you from all of that pressure. So right now, you just undo this clamp here. You've exposed yourself to whatever pressure is in the keg, so they're looking at a different solution for that. And also, this thermal well is probably gonna be welded in and integrated into the lid. So there's gonna be things that change, but the basic idea of this really holds firm in that I'm gonna put my beer into this and just like the regular keg, I can use this gas post here to be my blow off valve and just put that into some water. And then I can monitor the temperature of what the beer really is through this thermal well by putting in a thermometer into there, which is pretty nice because generally you can't tell exactly how cold your beer is in your keg. But how does this solve some of the problems that I mentioned about a regular keg? Well, what about the dip tube? There is just a regular old dip tube in here, not a floating dip tube. So does that run the risk of being clogged? Well, that's one of the nice design features of this keg. It's very difficult to see inside of here. But so the easiest way to show you this is on the bottom. Just take a look at the bottom of this keg. And then compare that to the bottom of a regular keg. This keg here effectively has a channel around it and that channel is where the tube is going to fall and the dip tube doesn't reach as far as that. So all of the gunk from fermentation is gonna end up here in this channel and it's going to be away from the actual dip tube and away from the beer. A bit like how a conical fermenter works. So that addresses that concern, but what about my concern about pressure fermentation and spunding? Well, fortunately, in addition to sending me the actual keg itself, this thing comes with a whole bunch of accessories. In fact, I had to put together a little storage container just to store them all. There's so many things here. Now for spunding, this does come with a digital pressure gauge, which you can use here on the gas outpost. And that will keep an eye on what the pressure is and anything above that will vent out. That still has the same problem as the regular kegs in that you have this just tiny area here that could potentially get blocked. So if that's not your thing, it also comes with the option of this spunding valve, which is pretty hardcore. Let's look at the size of the gap of this thing. Now the idea with this one is you screw this to set the pressure that you're looking for. So I'm gonna set this to 0.8 bar, for example, and then it hooks up to the top here. I fill this cup here with water, then any of the CO2 that is beyond the level that you set the spunning valve to will just bubble up. And then I've got a much safer spunning setup. I really, really like this guy. 
you can also vent the pressure by pulling on this at the top. This guy, in instead of using the spunding valve, you can attach this and you can use this for adding additions into your keg as you go. So for example, if I want to do a dry hop, but I don't want to open the top of this thing and expose it to air and to, to have to have vented all of my pressure out. Well, I can put it in here. I can then charge this up with CO2 and flush it out with the, with the PRV here. Then when I'm ready, I can drop the hops by pulling on this lever here. It'll open the butterfly valve and let the hops in, close it up and then I am good to go. And I've done that completely without exposing the keg to oxygen. So that's a, a pretty cool addition. I'm definitely going to be making use of that. There is also a floating dip tube option if that's what you want to do instead. And I can even use this carbonation stone here, hook this up to the gas post, and then I can be carbonating my beer and doing that in a way that will be a lot quicker than just force carving by just adding a lot of pressure into the keg. So it really does kind of address everything. Well, almost everything. You see, there's still the issue of temperature control. You've got a few options here. Number one is that you take this keg and you put it in a chest freezer or a kegerator or something like that and regulate the temperature that way. Or you could ferment under pressure and when you ferment under pressure typically fermentation temperature becomes a little bit less important so you could just use it ambient room temperature and not care as long as you're fermenting under pressure that's another option. Neither of those options would make up the ultimate fermentation keg in my book because I want to be able to regulate temperature control a bit more precisely than that. The keg did ship with this, a temperature control unit. So I have a thermometer here, which I put down that thermal well. Then I have a heating and cooling plug here, which is controlled by this controller. So I can set, for example, I want a fermentation temperature of 68 or 50 Fahrenheit or whatever. And then it would set the heating or cooling accordingly. So then the question became, how could I use this keg with my glycol system? The answer is this thing. This is called a cool stick or cool sticks. It's from Brewbelt and it just has two tubes in here. There's the in and the out. And the idea is that you flow liquid in and flow it back out again. A liquid like glycol, for example. And this fits in the 1.5 inch tri-clamp gap at the top of the keg. So now I can use the temperature controller to send cool liquid like a glycol in and out of the cool stick and that will regulate the keg. But if I start using that port at the top of my lid, I can't use my spunding valve. I like this thing. I want to use the spunding valve. So a little bit more engineering is required. Bear with me for this. So I need a T. So now I've turned one port into two. Then I need an elbow piece. To the elbow, I'm going to connect my spunding valve. There we go, spunding valve attached. And then I'm going to insert the cool stick. And here is the masterpiece a full spunding valve slash airlock and the ability for glycol chilling. Isn't it a beauty? But I think this is going to do everything I want out of a fermentation vessel. And the only way to find out is to brew something up, put some wort in here, and ferment something. Fermenting in the claw hammer keg seemed to go pretty well. After about two weeks, I added some pressure and cold crashed the beer. And I did notice that the cool stick was not able to get down to cold crash temperatures. I couldn't get any lower than about 43, despite running it for about two days. Regardless, with the beer cold crashed, I sanitized a second keg, then set up a jumper cable and performed a pressurized transfer out of the claw hammer keg and into the fresh keg. From there, I forced carbonated that keg and the beer was ready to serve. And here is said beer. There's a whole nother video behind this story. So how did I enjoy this keg? I gotta say, I kind of loved it. There's so many good things about this. It's a tiny footprint. It's easy to clean. I really like the ability to keep everything under pressure. So I didn't ferment under pressure, but I did use it for pressure transfers. It seems to work pretty well. Even my little cool stick temperature controller hack worked pretty well. It was great at maintaining fermentation temperatures. Didn't get down very cold for the cold crash, but look, 
I can just throw this in my keyser for the cold crash, so I'm not too worried about that. And there's a whole bunch of stuff on here that I just didn't use. I didn't ferment under pressure, I only did a pressure transfer. I didn't use the carbonation stone, that would have been kind of cool. I didn't use the floating dip tube either. So it's super versatile and there's more things that I could be doing with it. Overall, I've got to say, I'm a bit of a fan of this. I think this is a really nice way of fermenting and it gets around a lot of the drawbacks that I had with traditional fermentations in kegs. Although that works pretty well as well as long as you don't need to do anything under pressure too much or you don't need to control the temperature through a glycol system. Now I did another hardware review recently where I compared a plate chiller to a counterflow chiller. You can find that video there. Also, don't forget to check out everything else we're up to with Brewlosophy on brewlosophy.com, the Brewlosophy podcast and the Brew Lab. I'll be back next week and until then, think beer.